Uh, welcome to Whitman Partners Road Warriors Recognition Awards Series. That's a mouthful. Uh, we're talking to interim directors of surgical services, uh, SPD managers, and OR educators about their unique experiences leading departments on a temporary basis, you know, interim directors and managers. Uh, today, we have somebody that we know quite well and love, and uh, her name is Ann Ertel. And she's coming to us from uh, Canada at the moment in between interim assignments. But Anne and I have worked together in the past, uh, most recently at the University Medical Center of New Orleans. And we're happy to have Anne here with us today. Hi, Anne. Hi, it's great to be here, Ari. Great to see you again. Yes, you too. Um, let's just jump right in, all right? So when you are interviewing for these interim assignments, right, that's where it all starts. How do you distinguish yourself during an interview when you are interviewing for these assignments, knowing that you're probably up against one or two other people and you have that one moment to make a big impression? Well, you know, it's a great question. Um, I think that I, in the interview, I kind of focus a little on my proven track record, but I don't think that that is really just the selling note in itself. I think that it's really important um, to express genuineness, to really just be yourself. And the times that I've done that, I mean, I, I have to tell you, I've been very fortunate. Um, I think that most of the time I've received the interim assignment, um, but I've always felt the connection because they felt that I was genuine. And when I say that, it's you can't always be successful. You had to start someplace. So when they ask me certain or giving certain examples, I talk about the fact that, oh, that was something that I learned quite a while ago. And it was just a great lesson because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And so I think that in the conversation, conveying the fact that we're human, you know, we make mistakes, we grow. I think that giving them some really clear examples about that, they see that, um, yeah, I do have a proven track record and this is kind of a, a genuine soul. So I know I've repeated that word, but I sometimes think that that connection puts you, gives you an advantage. Yeah, right. Because, I mean, they're hiring a personality, right? And usually, like I said, you're up against one or two other people for these interviews. Often, I would imagine, backgrounds are similar, right? Oh, yeah, I've been there, done that. So what might make the difference is a little bit of personality um, and it would set you apart from somebody else. Yeah, and I would tell anybody starting this process that it's okay because sometimes they're looking for something in particular. So if I didn't get the assignment, then good. Good for someone else. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, okay, so let's go to the next question. And this is to the point where, you know, they like you seems obvious um, and you can tell that what question would you ask of them before you ac accept an assignment right it's a two-way street so you're interviewing them as well what do you try and make sure that you always ask um, before you accept an assignment well i always like to ask you know that that famous studer principle of what's working well what are the two or three things that you really need? What are the those outcomes that are just, you know, the priority? Like what's one, two, and three? When I'm talking with the C-suite, I always ask them to be very specific and, you know, to look at those specific outcomes. And then sometimes the first couple of days, I might uh, have another conversation with them or as it's turned out, because it's not always the way that you initially perceive it sometimes. So they might come back and say, oh, well, I really meant this. I really, actually, I really wanted you to focus on this. And that's okay too. But I think that's very important to get their idea of what is working well and what they need your services for. Um, okay, so dovetailing on that, I'm curious when you, you know, ask those questions and then they extrapolate a bit do you does that dovetail or does that lead to a conversation about timeline and expectations and how long they expect you to be there? Because my thought is usually these interim assignments, you know, the standard is 13 weeks, three months, which in 
is really no time at all, in my opinion, to change a department or, uh, you know, a culture. And so when they have, but sometimes if there's only maybe one or two things they need to do, it is, right? So I'm curious, does that ever come up um, when you ask? It does. It does, Eric. And sometimes, you know, I have to laugh because you're right, 13 weeks flies by. And I've never really been in all of my interim assignments. I've never stayed just 13 weeks. It's usually close to a year and then they're offering employment. <laughs> so uh, the reality is, is that uh, they'll talk and they can talk about timelines. Um, sometimes they're realistic and sometimes they're not because they might just even have just a couple things. But when you get on site, then they've added like four or five other things that they want you to do. But many times the conversation goes on to, well, what do you expect? Um, I remember one time I was in Wisconsin and the person, the COO was just very specific. So in and we really want you to be here for not 13 week assignment, but it was like six months. And in six months, we want this in the first month, the second month, you know, and it was, you know, obviously things evolve, but everybody's different. Some people come across and they can be very specific. And it's very organized. And others really just want you to come and help them because they have so, so many pressing needs. Um, OK, so let's go on to the next question that kind of lead that that led to um, you're often walking. So there's I just feel like there's so much expectation and maybe pressure put on an interim director of surgical services, right? Because mm -hmm. you can just tell maybe by the time they've made that decision, the department could be broken. Here you are coming in the person that's going to fix everything. Um, how which is. I can see maybe often being it like a powder keg situation. How do you quickly calm everyone's fears about this new leader coming in? Um, I guess both for you, you know, this unknown entity, but then also maybe what's going on in the, in the department. Well, yeah, I, I think that's probably this question is one of the most important because usually when you're coming in, everybody is you know, they're very stressed and they're nervous because this person's coming in new. What is she going to be like? And I think the one way or one strategy I've used is I'm very present. I'm not behind closed doors. I'm very present and I'm meeting people. I'm very open and I'm attentive to listening. That's the key thing is the listening because, you know, what I say in the very beginning is that this is about meeting your needs and getting to your goals. This isn't about my agenda. This is about what you need. And again, the commonality, right, of need. And that's from administration, that's from all stakeholders. And, and so sometimes, of course, stakeholders disagree on what their priority needs are. But the most important thing is to realize that you're there to help them attain their goals. You're, you're not coming in and you're not going to change everything the next day, the next week. You're there to support them. And you're there to sh look at those shared goals and identify them and be very open and honest about them. You know, discussing these are the number one, two, three. This is what I was hired to do, right? And then as I meet those people individually, because that's what I want to do when I first go in, I ask administration, I say, I want two days. I don't really, I don't want to be involved in meetings or anything. I just want a full agenda so I can be front and center in the suite so that people can meet me, they can see me, and they can ask anything because there's not a question I wouldn't take. And I think that's important because what that does is it says I'm being respectful to them. Um, and I value their ideas and what their concerns are. Um, so the one I took, the the one quick hitter that I quick hitter piece of information I took from that that I wrote down was no meetings for two days. Those first two days, which I think is a great idea, right? That some that another interim director could maybe steal from you, right? Like. Because I imagine in most cases, they probably are bombarded with meetings those first couple of days. Um, well, and then, you know, you just want to be able to know where the bathroom is and your office is. <laughs> and then, like you right. said, use that time 
to meet people in their natural environment, walking around, cruising around. Well, Eric, I find that it increases stress because if they don't see you and and they can't say, oh, yes, I met the new person and, you know, we discussed da, 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 and they're waiting for two or three days before you come out of an office or you're in all these high level meetings. What that says to the team, and I'm talking surgeons, anesthesiologists, nursing staff, I'm talking about everybody. It says, oh, well, obviously you know, she hasn't been released to us yet. And so when you do (laughs) that initially, it's just beautiful because they see that, hey, you know what? She she made it important to be here with us first. Or he. Do you, I'm curious if you ever, well, because one of the follow-up questions we had with that, but I think you touched on it, was how you gain the confidence of the staff when you're on an assignment. Um, And I'm just going to say, I mean, you're present, right? It seems like you're present. You're not stuck behind a closed door and they see you and you engage with them and you talk with them. Um, I lost my train of, train of thought there. I was going to ask a question on, on well, no, that. Well, no, I thought from that, one thing that I've done many times is like on the third day or even later on the second day, I show up in greens or whatever color they're wearing and I'm, I, I'm helping um, turn over a room. Now that's shocking. So on the, you know, for, or, or to go in at like 6.30 or whenever the, you know, first case is is happening, but to be there and that that really, that, that speaks, you know, that picture, it speaks mm-hmm. <laughs> a thousand words because, you know, you're there and then they think, wow, you know, she's, she's really present as opposed to like, you could do a town hall, you could have meetings, you could have a forum where you're there. But a lot of times what happens is you're there to meet the leadership of the OR. So, you know, the person over PAC you or the operating room and, and you don't really get to the full staff. And so just being visible and it doesn't take that long of a time. So that's another little tidbit I would pass along. It really means a lot. Do you ever try to maybe not outwardly, but identify um, advocates, confidants, future leaders, maybe as you're meeting people like charge nurse? Oh, this may be someone I'm going to take under my wing or this is someone I'm going to, you know, you know, I can tell this person has influence in the OR. I need to get them on my side. Any of that kind of, you know, psychology? Absolutely. You know, it's hard because you're there and you have so many competing pressing needs because, you know, the the surgeons and the anesthesiologists, everybody's waiting to like meet with you. But I found that um, and, and back to that Studer principle of, you know, when I meet with people, I ask them, you know, what do you like about the OR and who would you um, if you were going to. Uh, really thank somebody and be appreciative that they're present in the OR, who would that be? So sometimes when you're discussing with staff, some of those uh, really special people that are going to be your helpers, right, and your collaborators in the future are identified by other people before you ever maybe meet them. But of course, you're always, you're always looking and you're assessing um, but that's a great that's a great question because like there is no way that one person could go in and change something around. It's that whole team effect, right? And you want to look at who are your allies, who are the people that are going. It, it's almost like doing a a readiness survey, right? Are they really ready for change? Mm-hmm. Because some people are, and they're going to invite you in, and other people might say, "Oh, here we go, another." another new leader. So I think that it is very important to assess early on. And, you know, hopefully, you know, you're right at the end of the day, sometimes you might end up with somebody that turns out that, um, you know, they're not supportive of change. And, but you bet from the moment your feet hurt, (laughs) hit that perioperative suite, you're looking for those people. Um, But I was curious, do you actually have a checklist, like a first day checklist that you go through that you maybe physically will do? Or do you have a mental one or nothing at all? I I try to have nothing at all because, you know, when when you get to be my age and you've done this a lot, I've been consulting for a good, strong 10 years and before that in industry. Um, 
I, I try to be so present. Now I've got a four page detailed assessment that later on that day, I'm going to go back and do my checklist, right? Of just some of the logistical stuff. And then, but on that, I also put identif identifying key supports potential that we just had the conversation about. Mm -hmm. So it's really a very detailed list. And I got that when I initially consulted and I was with BRG and I was in charge of going and doing a lot of perioperative redesign work. And we came up with how do you do a detailed assessment? Cause you might have to fly someplace and go in and just assess the situation in an operating room. But I hung on to that. But when I go in the, my first day checklist is what I've already told you. I'm present. I don't have a lot of papers. It's all about relationships and building trust from day one. So that's what I'm doing. But I'm doing that. And I don't even have to have the sheet because I know it by heart, which is, hi, could, um, could I have a few minutes of your time? And it could be somebody that just started there as opposed to somebody that's been there 20 years. But you, you can't meet everybody, but you really get a mixed group. And then you're asking them individually, not, not together, uh, those questions that I've already outlined, and that is, um, what's working well? Uh, what would you like to change? What you would you like to see not only stay, but even get stronger, right? And, and then the things of as far as who would you like to recognize within the operating room? But those personal conversations, and then they get to see you, and obviously there's some small chit chat and you know the developing stage of some relationships, so they can feel comfortable to know that there isn't anything that they really couldn't ask me. Now everybody's different. A lot of people aren't comfortable. I'm somebody I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin, and and I love people, so I really enjoy that exchange. I am curious, so. You know I think it may be a good time to talk about consulting versus being an interim director. Um, Cause I'm curious if you have to overcome that. If, if they understand when you're coming in as an interim director, you're on their team. That's how I see it. And maybe as a consultant, you're not so much on their team. You're there to point out some inefficiencies and some people might lose their jobs as a result. Do you, right. and I don't see an interim being that type of person, right? You're not, no. Coming home as, hey, we need to get rid of this person and that. Do you have to overcome that at all? Or do they know when you come in, you know, this person's on our team? Well, I think that communications. Yeah. I mean, communication is just key. I mean, when they look at my CV and if they were part of the people that interviewed me, they know that I have consulted and I've had those kinds of assignments. But then to be very clear. This is my role. I am an interim. I am on your team. This is the team and we're going to be together for however long. I usually, you know, because since I've never been someplace for 13 weeks, it's I'm here. I, you know, I've accepted this assignment. I'm thrilled to be here and we want to work together and just have a great team and, and be able to achieve as much as we can together. But as I am an interim, you know, I have an entry point and an exit point, but I'm on your team as opposed to being hired to um, look at some of those efficiencies, which, you know, certainly could. I mean, in this day and age, let's face it, um, recruitment retention is at top of the list, right? I mean, that's so important. And so, and we also know that that's going to take a lot of time because many of the places that are requesting your services need staff. So the, the last thing they want to think about is the fact that you're there uh, to help with attrition. <laughs> no, you're, help, you're there to help with re recruitment. I think it's also important they feel that you're part of a team when you have those common goals. Is it to hire, to train staff? Maybe they also need an educator. You know, it's, it's whatever it is. Yeah. Um, I'm curious. So this, that was a good dovetail into, because we're thinking of, I mean, the operating room is where most, if not all, the revenue is generated for the hospital. And so we have to ask the question, um, what do you see that most affects the, like these revenue cycles for these hospitals? Or what challenge do you see repeatedly over and over that affects, you know, their revenue in the OR? 
Well, there's there's many things, um, but and I would say especially it's a sensitive question coming through, you know, COVID because again, it's when you have to shut an OR down, <laughs> the revenue stops. And right now we have so many hospitals. I mean, I was just looking at the losses that um, hospitals have incurred uh, over the last two years, and it is. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, uh, it's astonishing. <laughs> and, and so obviously a key thing is resources, human resources, having experienced perioperative staff being able to work. But I'm not going to, I would say that that's paramount, but one of my biggest uh, things related to revenue has been supply chain and has been the the waste, the, the waste that we still experience uh, every day in our operations. Um, and some of that is because of the culture, whether it's a nurse or surgical tech wanting to open up everything. And some of those items are so expensive. And not only are they expensive, but wow. coming through the last couple of years, you might not be able to replace them or wait for some time to be able to replace them. So I think that to me, one of the paramount things for being successful in perioperative is to address that the waste that occurs and get a handle on that with supply chain and that also relates to sterile processing mm -hmm. and being able to have what is needed to get through the day um, and and keep your patients safe because at the end of the day that's what it's all about right the culture of safety so I, I kind of gave you a, two answers there. I started because we all know that everybody is living through the incredible shortages, right? Mm -hmm. But I would say to you that outside of what we were hit with, with the pandemic, and we're still experiencing, that I, I really think the um, supply chain and the waste within the operating room is the biggest impact on the revenue. How about you mentioned the pandemic? So, is there a lesson or a, a lesson or two maybe you've learned um, because of the pandemic or since we started this, entered this pandemic that changed the way you work or um, you know you operate in your workspace or at the hospital? It's a great question, um, you know, and I'm I'm going to answer you on several levels. One is personally, the way I've changed my work is I was really impacted by uh, the pandemic in the standpoint that it affected me personally. I actually uh, was working at a large teaching hospital and I went on vacation. And now this is after going through the first two rounds of COVID and completely shutting down the operating room. And I realized um, when I went on vacation, I experienced insomnia, pretty profound insomnia. And to the point where um, I was gone for some time. And I, I mean, after trying, of course, medications to help you sleep, I ended up on some cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which was really helpful and really saved the day for me. And I have never, ever experienced the inability to sleep. And so, of course, my doctor, you know, said, this is you realize that you're affected because of all of what you went through in that experience. Because what I did was you're already stressed. It's a crazy job, probably one of the hardest in the hospital. And then you're taking care of staff that have experienced losses. They've lost loved ones. They have been impacted themselves. I had several people that couldn't walk from one side of the OR room to the other. I was fortunate because we were able to get them um, you know, work, workman's comp, and they were covered because they had families they needed to feed. But I think that doing that, I was burning the candle at both ends because I was so involved in being a compassionate soul. I wanted to help everyone. But what I learned through the process was I gave a little too much of myself and I burn out like many people. You've read the articles, you've listened to, I'm sure, read the research. Uh, and I never thought in a million years it would affect me of all people, somebody that I had no idea. I'm happy, go lucky. I'm, you know, very fortunate to have a wonderful family and life. And, but yet it affected me. And it was a period, it took me time to heal. And so I would say how I've changed that is I really acknowledge the fact that 
you can't continue to go and burn the candle at both ends. And, you know, I needed at that time we had limited resources, but now there's more people in place with social workers and clinical psychologists to help the staff. I was I was trying to be everything to those people because they they were trying to make appointments and everything was booked up. Right. So I learned my lesson there is in setting limits. So that's one thing I learned through COVID or and anything like that. Like I uh, my my work life balance wasn't healthy. And then the second thing I learned was very you know different from my personal experience is that it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't have to go to a physical meeting. And in the operating room, always you would have you'd meet with sir the, the chief of surgery, the chief of anesthesiologists, the your um, director of nursing or the COO or whoever you were reporting to. But it was amazing how through COVID you learned that you could have team meetings. You could get together and talk or have a four-way conversation and come together in suppose of all these individual meetings. So I learned that we could be a lot more efficient and not have all those individual meetings when a lot of times we'd say, oh, well, that's because anesthesia does it that way, or that's because the surgeons. But if when all the stakeholders are together in those meetings, you get to root cause, right? And then you get to the outcomes you need to get to. So I learned that through the pandemic, that it's very important not to waste time. Like we talked earlier about wasting you know, resources or wasting goods, right? Well, not to waste time and come together and have one meeting with the stakeholders as opposed to all those individual meetings that we once had. Do you think that'll stick? Uh, I sure think that uh, it'll stick for for me. I, I mean, obviously, going into other organizations in the future assignments, um, I think that, you know, they, they might still want their individual meetings. But I think it's very important that when you go to make a decision, you pull everybody in. Yeah, I was curious because. It seems like it um, like that would be the most efficient way to conduct that process but i wonder also if it's about facetime right everybody wants their own individual facetime with so and so but if we could get over that because it, it eliminates finger pointing right because you're like well so and so said and then you're like well okay now i need to go you know, address uh, that with think, this person on the next day instead of all of us <laughs> in the same room at the same time eric when i think of the wasted time like you're still getting facetime it's still important to have that cup of coffee and that time in either the lounge or you know at the front desk it, the facetime will always be there or even private in your office but when it comes to talking about an issue that you need a resolution to it's oh you know what let's i know we started to talk about that but let's go ahead and pull in um the other key stakeholders so that the issue can be fully vented and expressed and all so all sides because there's so much wasted time in the back and forth um i'm also curious so i used to be a teacher and i am very uh, my third year i experienced similar um, burnout that you were mentioning i had trouble sleeping which led to you know you, that goes on for a couple of days then that will lead to another you know other issues um and i had to try and learn to set limits myself and pull back because i was similar trying to do everything for everyone all of my students if i just rearrange the desk this way then that'll you know, affect this and um i learned you know i can't you can only do what you can do inside the classroom right i'm not the parent of all these children i just have to try the hardest i can um and be okay with that but I'm curious how you would set limits. You know, was that I'm leaving the building at a certain time and not going to look at my phone or what are some of the ways that you implement that? Um, that that's a great question. And, and, and why I love the question is because I spent time, you know, part of my therapy was with a clinical psychologist saying, it's not OK to take a call at four o'clock in the morning or five, but we know that the OR gets started because you're starting to get the patients ready and sometimes issues come up. 
but you can't do that every day. So how you would change that? Because they asked me, so that's not healthy behavior, Anne. How are you going to fix it? Because it's on you to fix it. So then what you do is you just take a calendar. So on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you know, the other people are taking that. Maybe I'm on for Thursday at that hour. Um, and again, if it's something that falls out that it is like an emergency. I mean, let's face it, in the OR, we have lots of emergencies. And the biggest emergency is when somebody's bleeding out and you've got to make sure all the resources and the equipment is in the room, right? But it's unlike the fact that maybe so uh, a surgeon wants to talk to you because he's leaving to go on vacation the next day. <laughs> you know, so that's not the emergency, right? Yeah, so, yeah. But, but I always, you know, what I did was I availed myself so that you know, any call, you know, as my husband was <laughs> any call, you know, I was taking, you know, all of these calls, but they can be delegated better. And so one of my things so that I could sleep was that I would be on on those, you know, and who who were the people who were the support systems to be able to take those calls? Well, the director of the OR might take that call on Monday through Wednesday, you know, maybe the director of PACU would take that call on another two days. And then I was on, but it was a shared responsibility. So you wouldn't get burnout and everybody was, you know, we respected one another, right? Because yeah. nobody wanted somebody to burn out. So that was something, that's just one small example of how to make sure that you're not on 24 seven because nobody can be, nobody can be. I'm curious. I think this will probably be our last question about assignments specifically unless this dovetails to another one but we've had questions come up about certain interim assignments at maybe a hospital that's small or has a bad reputation or even taking an interim assignment um, when you've only been a permanent person and it comes to a point in your career where you're mid job or maybe you're thinking about that and we've had people ask us you know i'm a i'm a you know, how will that look on my resume to a future employer? Or I'm afraid to take an interim assignment because ultimately I'd like to land somewhere permanently. Can you speak to that at all? Has it, do you feel like your interim assignments have had a, a negative or positive effect for your employment? And have you ever, do you, should interim professionals consider, you know, the reputation of a hospital or the, the size of it before they take the assignment? Oh, it's such a great question. That's probably one of the best questions. Um, and it, it's so funny. My own personal experience is that I see it as such a positive because I've tried to encourage some people that I've worked with through the years to become interim and, you know, interim managers and to take assignments. Um, and and the, sometimes they're scared to for exactly what, what you've asked, that it might be a negative. And I express to them that you know, when, when I did it, it's, it's like, wow, it just opens up so much. It was, it's such a positive thing. And I think it's reflected very, it's been a very positive experience. Now I'm not going back into um, industry. So when I was giving you my response about when I had my burnout, I was in industry, right? Yeah. Um, and I had done that because my, my kids lived in uh, there at a particular place and I, I went to join them to be there. And, but that was my experience, but I love the interim assignments. And when I, people have come after me for, you know, a permanent assignment, but they look at my diversity and my background with the interim assignments and if they see it as a positive, I think, so I think facilities or people that are looking for you, whether it's permanent or interim, see that it's a very positive, you know, sometimes hiring HR, you know, they might look at it like, oh, well, you know, here it's going to be maybe more costly or something. They look at it short term. Um, so, you know, I do see that someone may see it with a negative connotation. However, usually it's some hospitals, depending on size, they're looking for some fresh blood, somebody with new ideas and some excitement, and they know that it's not going to be forever, but yet they're excited about having an interim. Um, I mean, and let's be quite honest, in this day and age with, you know, some of 
the, our employment struggles. Um, some hospitals are saying, please just send me anybody <laughs> because we need somebody so desperately to be in a leadership position. It's so critical. So my own personal experience, like I have just seen it just so incredibly positive. Um, the fact that people can ask me questions and I can say that, yeah, I've been at this large teaching academic or um, um, you know, trauma facility, or I've been, whether it's tertiary, quaternary, and I've been at a very small regional hospital or a little community hospital. Um, so, I mean, I, and I, I don't know what other people would say, but I do know that it has been one thing for me, I've understood that there are some negative connotations because people are scared. They're, they're afraid and and they would be some of them would make the best interim people because they are such good relationship people. Do you I'm kind of going off the cuff here, but I'm I think what speaking of this when you mentioned the word scared or um you know trepidatious or something to that effect of making that leap. Um, I think of finances, right? There is, if you have a permanent <clears throat> employment, there is some safety and security and health insurance, uh, consistent salary and paycheck. Right. Of course. In our world, it isn't consistent. Can you speak to that? Like, do you, let's say I'm a, a 35 year old uh, nurse with one child. Do I need like a nest egg to, to make that leap? into the interim world um is that I, that's that's a scary part for me <laughs> no it's scary and some of the biggest concerns are health care uh, are you know the benefits right Hel having health care because the you know you, if you're not to the magical age of 65 and you're not covered you have to provide that right and then to your point too you also have to have that income right so it is important you know when i made that leap you know my my mother uh, had passed away i was taking care of her and my husband was tremendous support um i was really ready for a change and i didn't have additional resources i didn't have the retirement uh, i didn't have the health care benefit i did it because i was very bored doing the same thing over and over. I wasn't a, built to be a long-term maintainer. I love to go and help and uh, do turnovers, you know, not those small turnovers, but the big turnover. And I, it was a leap of, of faith for me, um, but I, I didn't have, a, I didn't have the padding, but I did it because if I stayed and kept it status quo, then I wouldn't be happy and I wouldn't be fulfilled. But everybody has a different story. I have a couple of friends that are just waiting till they can, you know, get um, their health care benefits so that they can, because it's important for them. They're not, I should say, um, they didn't take, they couldn't take the leap that I did. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out for me. Um, and I really uh, haven't really known anyone where they've done it and it hasn't because, mm -hmm. you know, it's. It's so important. Somebody asked me, could I take a sabbatical from my <laughs> normal job and, and do an assignment? And I think people need to do what they feel comfortable with because you don't want to be stressed out financially and you're on an interim assignment hoping it might last for a year. And then in the 13 weeks, it's over. Everything has been met and they don't need you anymore. And then where's the next assignment? Yeah. I've just never had that as an experience. They've always wanted more and more. Can you stay for another 13 weeks, another six months? I, I, I probably a bit of really helped and given an answer. I just think it's important because if you're not, if you're wanting to do something different and you're wanting to be out there and be an interim, then I think you should go for it. I mean, because for myself personally, it was incredibly successful. I'm so glad I did it. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of a leap of faith, I think, right? And just time, any any change is a little bit of a leap of faith. But I liked how you said 
maybe think of it as a sabbatical. I mean, a true sabbatical is, you know, you're not going to replace it with <laughs> other other work, but maybe it's, you know, I'm taking a sabbatical from my permanent employment with whatever facility it is to take on some interim work for a year just to give myself a break, but also just gain experience. Like you said, if you're, I mean, I look at it as someone that's that that does have a multitude of experiences when you look at a resume like that, right? Oh, I'm an academic medical center or a critical access hospital, or they were an OR interim manager at a at a, you know a place in Ohio or whatever it was, um, as opposed to pigeonholing somebody, right? Yeah. But it's always about just kind of taking that that leap of faith, and I think. Um, we're connecting people with people like you are watching these videos too, right? Because <laughs> they were having like a, I think that would maybe be something that we could think about, like a mentor program for new interims, mentoring up with folks like yourself that have done it a while. It's a great point. You need, it's important to feel the support. It's very important. And, and anytime it is your first interim assignment, you'd need to have that support. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I really like Whitman Partners. Um, I mean, I've been big supporters of yours for of quite some time, but just, you know, it's important to have that level of support for anybody that is doing it for the first time. Um, and I, I think that's critical. You know, I had a colleague uh, that contacted me about three months ago and said, Ann, I'm gonna do this. Would you mind if I have any questions I could call you? And I said, in a heartbeat, call me anytime, anytime. I am happy to help you. Because, you know, you feel like all oh, you're already being stressed because you have the whole perioperative, all the stakeholders, right? And then sometimes you think, well, you know, it's a dumb question, but I don't want to ask them. I want to ask somebody else. So she's already called me twice and they were just, I mean, I told her anything. And so, and she was so happy that you know she had somebody to bounce something off of that you know it wasn't she didn't feel like it was an embarrassing question you know i'm at a certain point where nothing is embarrassing and mm, there's no stupid question right ask anything mm -hmm. so yeah maybe find a mentor like i think that's that goes in a lot of ways in life right that seems to be um something that's in the zeitgeist right now mentors for whatever Finding uh, you know happiness, think, even though I'm a gajillionaire or or a business mentor, but in your case, you know, a professional mentor. Um, keep your eyes open for someone like that, and just ask them. Hey, Harry, I do it. This. I do it all the time. You know, myself. Like you know, even though I've been doing this for a long time, I call people. I call friends. I say, you know, didn't we? You know, a long time ago, wasn't there a concern about this, and how was that resolved? I mean. It's just so important. It's really important to have a network of support. Uh, all right. Well, let's lighten the mood a bit, at least for the <laughs> next question, and we'll see where these go. Um, one of the ones that we came up, you travel a lot as as an interim. Um, do you have an opinion on what airports may have the best airport food? <laughs> or just best airport for yeah. LA? Yeah, well, gosh, I don't, I, there would be some competing ones, but as far as, you know, the food, I will tell you that, you know, I lived in New Orleans um, for the past three and a half years. I don't live there now, but um, they just built a brand new airport and like they have um, Emeril Lagasse, they have one of his restaurants. They really supported the community. Um, they also have, um, I mean, just like so many wonderful, like even Mr. Ed's, I'm, I'm crazy about like oysters, oysters were like Rockefeller and stuff like that. And, you know, um, there's just, I, I mean, there's just an incredible selection, unlike any other. I used to like Boston because they had legal seafood, and I always like to, you know, get uh, some of the things there. But, uh, yeah, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, Le Leah Chase, she, yeah, she's no longer, but she had a wonderful restaurant in New Orleans for years. It's famous. Mm -hmm. um, uh, President Obama visited there. and But there's one in the that uh airport right and so it's just uh 
you just, it's just a melting pot and incredible flavors. And so I would have to say I, I would vote. Coming back. Yeah, I wonder, I, th I'm, I think it's um, because Portland has some pretty good restaurants in our, in our airport as well. And I, and I was thinking of O'Hare um, and they have um, some good restaurants as, as well. I can't think of the chef I'm trying to think of who's got a bunch yeah. of restaurants. In yeah, O'Hare does. I, you know, I've been in Chicago so many times. Um, but I guess I'm like, I guess maybe they start to reflect the town or the city that they're in, right? Because you said New Orleans sound very, very New Orleans type food, which makes sense. It makes me think of baseball stadiums too. They're starting to, you know, they do that more and more. You can get sushi at, you know, Mariner games and things like that. Yeah. Probably. I was proud. I, I, I was good. proud that they did that, you know, that they made that investment. You know, another uh, really nice airport is Miami, you know, I mean, they have some great food. Well, uh, I appreciate your time here today, Anne. It was nice chatting with you again and, you know, in person, face to face. A lot of our conversations have been on over the phone. So it's nice to see you uh, in person. And the conversation we had prior to this interview was great. And, uh, you know, just kind of mm -hmm. reconnecting and talking about our families and our dogs and our pets. So, you know, it's been really nice to have you as part of our Whitman Partners, Road Warriors. I know it's a privilege. Uh, yeah, you're a true ward, road warrior, um, if if there ever was one. And, um, yeah. you know, we hope to be able to work with you again on, a on your next interim assignment. As oh, long I don't as know. I'm looking to... forward to that. <laughs>